Question. What were the ancestors of ferns according to Genesis 1.11? Ferns. But you see, they themselves had no ancestors. One morning they weren't there. By the afternoon break they were there. Question, what were the ancestors of orange trees? Were they ferns? No. Now you see the biblical picture and there's no way of avoiding it. You see it says ten times in Genesis chapter 1 that God created things to produce their own kind. This is the first of those sayings that's going to crop up. And counting the number of words is actually important in some of these things. There's a lot of information actually tucked in the number of words that are there. But you see ten times it says God created things to produce their own kind. Actually, Charles Darwin has a theory which says things don't produce their own kind. Have you caught up to that? You want a simple definition of evolution? That's the simplest you can get. Molecules that weren't fruit trees, somehow after they'd been algae for millions of years, became fruit trees. And some of them turned to the right and became professors in university who write books about it. Right? That's a, they don't produce their own kind. And you see, when you're going out into the field and you're trying to say, well, if the theory of evolution is right, what evidence would I look for? Or if the biblical picture of creation is right, what evidence would I look for? Always try and reduce it to the simplest possible difference. Because most of us, let's be honest, we aren't Einsteins. We can handle one thing at a time. And that's a very good one to begin with. So if we're going out into the field today and Genesis is right and you find some fossil plants you've got two options. You see, if those plants are still on this planet today, you'll have no trouble recognizing them because the ones on the planet today will have descended from what? The ones that used to be here that began as created creatures. So if you find any fossil pine cones today, guess how you will recognize them? They look like fossilized pine cones, right? But there's another option. You see, the world began good, and by the time you get to Genesis 3, it's gone from good to bad. By the time you get to Noah's flood, it's way downhill. Some creatures may not have made it. So will there be some plants you can't recognize? The possibility exists that there may be. So you've got two options you can go looking for. Of course, if evolution is true, you would expect to find some sort of evidence that creatures that weren't plants somehow became creatures that were plants that finally turned into ferns or orange trees or pine cones, correct? Yeah. Okay. How many ands in the first chapter of Genesis in the King James Bible? How many ands? You've, you've never studied your Bibles that well? What a shame! Ah. Well, look, see, see if this is right later on. Are there 131 ands? Check it out later on. You, you see, the interesting thing is by the time you go from Genesis 1 onwards, if you were writing this in English and you put full stops where the editors of the King James put it, your English teacher would go, you can't do that. Because virtually every verse says, well, the first one's the exception. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and from then on it says, and God did this, and God did that, and God did this, and you use and in English when you don't intend people to stop. Isn't that true? Oh, the reason I do that is, you see, there are some Christians who when this problem that Charles Lyell and Steno and Hutton had brought up, they come up with this nifty theory. They said in between verse 1 of Genesis and verse 2, there was millions of years. Well, it never started as millions of years because, you see, the world, even in Darwin's day, most people thought it was no older than six to 10,000 years. And by the time Darwin had finished university, he thought it might be 20,000. By the time he'd read Charles Lyell, it could be hundreds of thousands. And so many of the Christians, with the best of intentions, said, well, we have to do something with all this evidence that the scientists are digging up. They failed miserably to see it wasn't evidence that was being dug up. It was the glasses they were being given to wear. And so what they did was they said, between verse 1 and verse 2, there must have been millions of years, and that's where the fossils came from. Uh, it became known as the gap theory, the ruin reconstruction theory, and the result of that was that for many years, Christians swept the fossils under the bed and hoped they'd go away, and they could start to read Genesis literally from verse 2. And the trouble is, whenever you sweep anything under the bed, 
it doesn't go away at all. Have you noticed that? Every time you lift up the edge of the blanket, it's still there. And sooner or later, the wind can go the other way and blow it back all in your face. And that's what's happened with the gap theory. Because it started out as a gap of 10,000 years, 20,000 years, and now the gap is 4.6 billion years. Question, who would you believe? The scientist who knows the last 4.6 billion years or the God of the Bible who only knows the last 6,000? Who has more knowledge? Do you see what I mean? It's blowing back in your face and it's turned around and it's bit you on the backside. Can I suggest when you look at Genesis and you're trying to answer questions like this, don't read it with the aim of trying to fit what the present scientific theory is into the Bible. You see, because here's the crucial point for our trips. The God of the Bible insists that even the scientist humble himself to accept that God's word is always true. And if you can't figure out what it means, please don't blame God because it's more likely that you are the dodo, right? And not him. When you get up to making universes, you feel free to enter into competition with him. But until then, uh, please humble yourself and say, what did God actually mean by this? What would it imply to the fossils? What am I going to have a look at? What, what's actually out there? Okay, one chance only for a couple of questions. Has anybody got any questions on what we've done this morning before we pack up and get ready to uh, head out? Yes, sir. In that, is that it there? Yes. You'll see there's a pink blob in the centre. Mm -hmm. Is that supposed to be a cross section or a pimple on the earth? Good question. My apologies for not explaining. We're looking at a cross section. So we've imagined the earth is a big orange like it is in commonly used classroom experiments and you've chopped it in two. And so on the second day of creation, the simplest picture you can draw is a sphere of water, a sphere of air, another sphere of water, and something that's not even mentioned that's inside that's not going to pop up until the third day. Good question. My apologies for not explaining that. Anybody else? Follow the same question, your third day B and C, how mm -hmm. can that sort of change into your carbon dioxide and the rest? I just missed that point. Okay, state that again carefully for me. For your day three, three, three A and B, three B and three C. B yeah. and C. Yep. How that second heaven in the white bit change from the original sort of nothing to your carbon dioxide and all that? Oh, okay. So what we've got on the third day of creation is God making a world on which he's going to put plants. Okay, so by the end of the third day, we are up to this picture. Now on the first day of creation and the second day of creation, we have no idea of what's in the atmosphere for one simple reason, there's nothing living that needs to breathe. It could be total nitrogen if God wanted it to be, it doesn't need to be anything else. Right? Any sediments that are formed even on the third day of creation will never have been exposed to that atmosphere anyway, so they won't give you much of a clue as to what would have been in the atmosphere. But by the end of the third day, you have a problem which has had to have been solved by the time you get to the afternoon. You have roses. And if roses have produced their own kind, then you can check the roses today. One thing you can find out about roses is they won't grow in an atmosphere unless there's oxygen or carbon dioxide. You see, when you have a look at the rose, it breathes in, what does it take in to, to do? What does it take in carbon dioxide, correct? And it breathes out oxygen, but at night time it reverses that. So you see, one thing we know for sure is that the atmosphere had to be ready for plants, and since these plants have produced their own kind, we do have a link here in which there is a part truth that the present is the key to that. Oh, you see, the devil is a very good liar. His lies are never a hundred percent false. The hard ones are the ones that are mostly the truth. So what we've just done is establish that there are some things that connect the past to the present, or we couldn't do anything with geology. That's why, as I said, geologists got off and running because of the influence of Christianity on their thinking. It gave them a door, it gave them a key, it gave them a path that they could follow.